Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus is present in this place through the power of the Holy Spirit. He rests on our shoulders and fills this sanctuary, filling our hearts, our lives this day. And the Holy Spirit calls us to worship. So would you join with me in the call to worship that you'll see on the screens and also in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation may spring up. Amen. Well, it's great to see everyone this morning. Together, I pray that we would experience the presence of Christ as we gather together for worship this day, that we would experience Christ's presence in our worship, that we would experience Christ's presence in our friendship, in our fellowship, and our conversations with one another, and that when we leave this place, uh, we will go strengthened in our faith and more convicted and have a stronger desire to be people of love and grace and of mercy in this world as a result of having met with Jesus and having met with each other. So welcome, and it's great to see you. If you are a guest or a visitor or a family friend who's in town, welcome. This is a super fun time of year where we get to see family and friends and new faces. We're glad that you're here. If you are a longtime garden member, welcome. We're glad that you're here as well. Just wanted to remind everyone that we have friendship pads on the end of the rows, and we would invite everyone to go ahead and to sign in. Um, that helps us as we do our administrative stuff here as a church. Just a few announcements to share with you all. First, Christmas Eve is Tuesday, and we will be having our Christmas Eve service of Lessons and Carols. It's uh, our intergenerational, family-friendly uh, service. That's at 5 p.m. That includes communion. It, includes, it also includes uh, candlelight singing as well. So I want to extend an invitation to you all to be there for that. Um, this has been a, just a really fun and a busy week for us here at Gardens where we've had a chance just to be engaged in our community and, and serving our community. There were, uh, this past week we had a chance to continue our ministry over at Harbor Chase where we had chapel services both in the memory care facility and assisted living facility where we had 52 folks who joined in worship for those. Our carolers were, how many carolers from Guard? Over 20, right? 25 Gardens folks were caroling at Harbor Chase on Friday, so that was, that was awesome. The Christmas meals have been delivered to Reach, and the presents, the Christmas gifts, are all loaded in Santa's sleigh, in Jerry Adams' uh, car, and they're going to be delivered this week. So it's just been a great opportunity to develop and to continue to live into those mission partnerships. Yeah, Jerry. Yes, that's awesome. So for the 58 children there. Yeah. So thanks to everyone for, being, for participating in that angel tree, and thanks to the Adams for getting to play Santa as they head down later this week and dodge the raindrops. Um, those are the announcements that I have. And so now as we continue our worship, as we do during the Advent season, as we practice waiting and as we practice patience and as we mark time, with lighting of candles and with praying as we await Christ's coming at Christmas, um, I would like to invite the Atkins family forward. They're going to lead us in our Advent candle liturgy this morning where we will get to see four candles lit as we mark the time until Christmas Eve. You're going to light? You want to read? <laughs> Jesus says, I am coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. As the Lord has promised, in days to come, the Lord will send you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child. She will bear a son and name him Emmanuel. God is with us. Let us pray together. Holy God, banish the darkness as we light these candles. We welcome this light among us to be sons of the awe and wonder that dawns in your coming to us. Let your, line sh let your light shine in us, set us aflame with love. We wait in hope, peace, joy, and love with all your people through the ages and into tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
And I would invite the congregation to stand and to greet one another, welcome each other to worship and extend the peace of Christ. Wow. Ooh, a little loud. I don't know how the adult bell choir is going to feel after that. That was so magnificent. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh. And that clap applause is also for you, Cindy, <laughs> and for everyone who helped you. Uh, we're mixing things up a little today. The in your bulletin, the reading that says second scripture reading on the second page is really the first. And so I will read that to you now from Paul's letter to the Romans, actually the beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans. So listen now for the word of God to us all this morning. From Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, and set apart for God's good news. God promised this good news about his son ahead of time through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. His son was descended from David. He was publicly identified as God's son with power through his resurrection from the dead, which was based on the spirit of holiness. This son is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we have received God's grace and our appointment to be apostles. This was to bring all Gentiles to faithful obedience for his name's sake. You who are called by Jesus Christ are also included among the Gentiles, among these Gentiles. To those in Rome who are dearly loved by God and called to be God's people, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Be to Our second scripture lesson for today, which is listed in your bulletin as the first scripture lesson, and that's totally my fault. Of course, you know, not Linda's fault or Linda's fault. I changed up at the last minute, so I apologize for any distractions that that might have caused. But our second scripture lesson for today is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet. I feel like I say this a lot, but, you know, I am both of the age and of the profession in which I just repeat myself a lot. So if what I'm about to say to you is old news, then you can forget it. But if it's helpful, so be it. When we, as Christians, read the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, we do so through two different lenses, right? We read the Old Testament scriptures both synchronically and diachronically. Fun words that really mean simple things. Synchronically means synchronicity or within time. The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures were written at a particular time in history, in a particular context for the people of Israel, and they are words of God's prophetic hope to them. And so as we approach the Old Testament scriptures, it's important to lift out and to study and to understand and to interpret and to apply that meaning. We understand them for that moment in time in which they were proclaimed to the people of God. We also read them as Christians diachronically or across time. We understand both spiritually and theologically through the movement of the Holy Spirit, through the great tradition that has come to us in the Christian faith, through the, the writing and the canonization of the New Testament and the scriptures, that as a people of faith who began to follow Jesus and as Christianity began to develop, we began to read the Old Testament across time recognizing and still kind of affirming the way that those scriptures spoke within their context and in time, but now across. And so began to read them prophetically or began to read these Old Testament prophets in ways and seeing them in ways that spoke to and addressed Jesus Christ and the coming of Christ. And so in our passage of scripture for this morning, we, we will be most familiar with its interpretation as we think about it in that latter sense, diachronically, across time. This is the passage of scripture that was referenced, that was quoted by the angel Gabriel when he came to Joseph to announce that Mary was with child. 
It's the message of Emmanuel, of God with us, which we, through faith and with a very distinctly Christian confessional perspective, believe, refers to, and is applied to Jesus of Nazareth as Jesus the Christ. And we celebrate Jesus' coming as God with us, as Emmanuel, during this Christmas season. But what I'm actually going to do this morning is to focus more on that synchronic reading of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures. To talk a little bit about what it was like in its original context and how it was a word of prophetic hope to the people of Israel in the 10th century BCE. And my hope is that in doing that, we might get a new kind of lens, a new frame, maybe even a new appreciation for Christ's incarnation. As we think about what it means for God to be with us in the midst of all that life would bring, especially the way that God seems to always come to us in ways that are messy or even confusing, or all those times when God seems to come to us but it's never as clear as perhaps we would want. So with that disclaimer, that was pretty lengthy, uh, hear now the word of the Lord from Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I won't test, I won't ask, and I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant, and it is about, and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your families days unlike any that have come since the day of Ephraim broke away from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, in and through and by the power of your Holy Spirit, fall upon us. And in this time of silence, in this time of stillness, we pause to acknowledge your Spirit's presence and prepare ourselves to meet with you. Lord, we consent to your divine action and presence within our lives, and I pray that you would have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, in your name we pray, amen. So King Ahaz was in a bit of a panic. King Ahaz was the king of Judah, and he reigned somewhere in the 10th century BCE, And if you would just recall for a brief moment the history of Israel as we would read it in the Hebrew Scriptures, and you'll remember that after about a hundred years of a united monarchy in which King David, followed by King Solomon, kind of ruled all of a united Israel through their kind of their capital city of Jerusalem, you'll recall after about a hundred years of that united reign, there was a bit of a civil war, a bit of a division within the kingdom, and Israel this kingdom split into two different kingdoms, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom retained the name of Israel. The southern kingdom uh, was named Judah for the ancestral land of the tribe of Judah, one of Joseph's 12 children. And the southern kingdom of Judah retained the capital seat of Jerusalem the city of David, and it was the kingship, the line line of kings in the southern kingdom of Judah that were traced back to the Davidic line, the descendants of David, which have spiritual and theological significance in the history of Israel. So King Ahaz is king of the southern kingdom, Judah. 
He's of the Davidic line. And it happens to be that King Ahaz is trying to lead God's covenant people of the, this kingdom of Judah in a time in which they are at war. Now this happens a lot in the history of Israel because both Israel and then when Israel divided into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel, they were fairly insignificant nations surrounded by very significant nations. Israel and Judah never really had significant military presence, never significant cultural or um, economic presence, and they were always overshadowed by some strong and powerful neighbor, whether it was the Egyptians or the Persians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians. And so the history of Israel and Judah in the Old Testament is one of kind of political uncertainty that leads to religious and spiritual uncertainty. So, King Ahaz, king of the southern kingdom, is in a panic because Jerusalem is under siege. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Aram Damascus have decided to unite against King Ahaz's kingdom in Jerusalem and attack Jerusalem, trying to lay siege to Jerusalem. It was a bloody war, one in which many people lost their lives, in which King Ahaz himself lost a son, and in which all of the residents of Jerusalem were in a panic. They were fearful. They were afraid that Jerusalem would fall and that the Davidic line this line of descendants from King David to King Ahaz would be broken. Now again, you have to understand that from this theological spiritual significance. It was believed that this was God's promise. The Davidic line was the line in which the Messiah was going to come. Jerusalem was God's holy city of Zion. This was not just a mere home, although it was certainly that. This was not just a mere political leader, although Ahaz certainly was that. Their situation was rife with spiritual and theological significance. If Jerusalem were to fall, if the line of David were to be broken, then it would prove that God could not be trusted, that God was not present for God's people, and that all in which King Ahaz and all of Israel had ever hoped would prove to be non-existent. So this political crisis brought on a theological and a spiritual crisis. And so in the midst of this panic, Isaiah, the prophet, comes, comes to King Ahaz. Isaiah was not only just a prophet to the entire nation of Israel, to the southern kingdom of Judah, but he also served in King Ahaz's court. And he brought King Ahaz a prophetic word of hope. And in sum, what Isaiah basically says in really like strange, confusing, convoluted prophet talk, essentially what Isaiah says is, hey, King Ahaz, give it time. Everything's going to be okay. Jerusalem's not going to fall. Your Davidic line is not going to fall. Everybody is going to be okay. This war is going to end. That's essentially what Isaiah says. Now, he says it a little more artfully than that, using words like, there is a young woman who is currently pregnant. And by the time this young woman gives birth, and that by the time that this child who is, has been given birth to is old enough to eat butter or curds and honey, roughly three to four years, perhaps, then guess what? War and famine will have left your land, right? We could all just say to Isaiah, dude, couldn't you have just said, like, hey, in a few years, like, this whole war thing is going to be over and everything's going to be okay. But it wouldn't have been as artful, right? It wouldn't have been as dramatic. It wouldn't have been as convoluted or even confusing. And, you know, we could understand if Ahaz, in that moment in time, kind of grabbed the prophet Isaiah by the shoulders and kind of said, what? Who? Which woman? What's her name? Where is she living? When is this child going to be born? Who is this child? Where in the kingdom is this child going to be born? When is this child going to be weaned? Can I do anything to help this weaning process so maybe this war and violence could be accelerated out of here and so all the peace could come a little bit sooner? Can we please do that, perhaps? I, Ahaz could certainly be forgiven if that was what he responds. What I love about this particular passage of Scripture is kind of twofold. One, Ahaz doesn't say that. He plays the whole, like, pretend pious card, right? That bit about, I'm not going to test the Lord my God. 
One thing you can give Ahaz credit for is that at least he knows his Old Testament. He knows that in Deuteronomy 6, 16, it says, Thou shalt not, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so Ahaz is kind of theologically savvy enough to know that if given an opportunity to put God to the test, our knee-jerk response from all those years in Sunday school and all those years having to listen to boring sermons is what? No, I'm not going to put God to the test. Like, that's crazy. And yet, so he gives that kind of pious answer, and Isaiah says to Ahaz, man, you are so tiresome. You are wearisome. You're annoying, and I see through your game. He says, you're not being pious. You're pretending to be pious, but what you really are is scared. You're scared. You don't want to ask God to give you a sign, because what if God doesn't? You don't want to ask God to show you that God will be and is present and will offer you salvation and deliverance. Because what if you put yourself out there and you ask God for a sign? You beg God to reveal God's self and God's power in the midst of this fear and brokenness and God is silent. How do you come back from that? So dressed up in this piety, Ahaz is really just scared and afraid and shows a lack of trust and faithlessness. And who can blame him? I mean, his kingdom is under siege. He's lost his son. He sees his people bloody, killed. He's already asking where God is and how God could let this happen and get this far. And so now he's afraid to double down. It's almost as if Ahaz is saying, if my, my faith, I'm barely holding my faith together at this moment of crisis right now. If I were to ask God for a sign and God were not to show up, how in the world could I come back from that? But Isaiah says, okay, that's fine, I get it. You don't have to ask for a sign. I'll give you a sign. I'll give you a sign to prove that God is is with you. And that gets into that whole convoluted young woman, pregnant, going to give birth, somewhere in the kingdom, unnamed place, unnamed time. But eventually, eventually, Ahaz, trust that God is with you. Trust that God will offer that salvation and that deliverance that you need. Trust that God, God's name, is God with us. And that all will be well. Trust. What I love about this passage of scripture, kind of two or three things. The first is that Isaiah and God through Isaiah brings this message of, frankly, of grace and of hope to Ahaz, who, objectively speaking, is not a good guy. Like the scriptures tell us a little bit more, books of the book of Kings tells us a little bit more about what Ahaz was like as a person, as a king, as a father, as a husband, as a leader and a spiritual leader of Israel and like or Judah. And trust me, like he's he kind of fails in every capacity, every quotient, right? He is idolatrous to the Lord his God. He actually sacrifices one of his children in an act of pagan worship. Um, he is uh, just in general. Not what you would draw up as a great political or spiritual leader. I don't love the fact that Ahaz was that kind of a bad dude. But what I love about the fact is that God still comes to Ahaz and gives him this amazing gift of grace. This word of prophetic hope. If Ahaz is as Ahaz-ish as he is in his kind of just brokenness. And God is still willing, still full of love, still full of deliverance, still desires to be present in Ahaz's life and to give Ahaz a word of grace and of hope. And God promises not to abandon Ahaz. And God promises not to abandon Ahaz's people. Like, How much hope does that give me? I mean, I fortunately have not sacrificed a child in an act of pagan worship. Like, I'm not a good dude. I get that. But I haven't done that. And so thanks be to God that if God still loves Ahaz, maybe God still might love 
me. If God doesn't fail to abandon, God doesn't abandon, and doesn't fail to respond to Ahaz, then maybe God won't abandon me. That's how big God's grace is. Even somebody like Ahaz, God is still present to and for and insists, God is insistent on blessing and providing this deliverance for Ahaz and Ahaz's people. So God's like, you don't want it? Too bad. You're going to get it anyways. I'm going to bless you. Sorry. Thanks be to God for that grace. The second thing I love about this passage of Scripture is how messy this sign of God is. Somewhere along the way, when we religious people have like turned faith into this thing that looks and has to look like certainty. Like we, we've, turned, we've turned spirituality and faithfully trying to follow God into this act of always being sure we know what God is doing in the world and we know what God wants for our life. But the reality is, we have no idea what God is doing in the world. We have no idea what God wants in our life. I mean, yes, we have some grand big themes, like God is is working for the salvation and restoration of all things. But when we see the suffering in our life, when we see the brokenness and the suffering in this world, when we see war and violence, when we see people that are just pushed to the sides and the margins. We wonder, we ask ourselves, like, where is God and what is God doing and how come God's not acting in, in, in more quickly or in bigger, stronger ways? And somehow along the way, we've, we've, we've turned faithfulness and we've turned the definition of true faith into like oppressing and denying that those questions exist, Right? And so we say things like, I, we pretend to have like certainty about what God wants for us. And we say things like, so I was praying the other day, and I felt like God said this to me. And we're completely convinced that we know exactly what it is that God has told us to do. But the reality is, is like, it's just not that simple. I mean, sure, you may have a hunch. You may have an urge. You may have this sense that the Spirit is moving and working. But can we, as human beings, ever be 100% certain? That takes the whole faith game out of play. I mean, part of what it means to be a person of faith is to be able to acknowledge, like, there's this part of me that is just, I'm, I'm just doing the best I can. I'm just trying to listen and trying to figure out what God is doing. And i got to be honest, like, this is what I think, but I, I'm not 100% certain. And so it would be foolish of me to say I'm completely certain, but because I actually think the Spirit of God is moving in this way, I'm just going to do it and pray that right or wrong, the Spirit of God will be with me to forgive me if I'm moving in the wrong way and to strengthen me if I'm moving in the right way. Right? That's what faith is actually like, Right? It's just messy. It's sloppy. Even when God speaks to us, like, it's opaque and it's convoluted. I mean, we want God to say, okay, uh, it's, uh, on the road, at, it's 11.15 on Sunday, December 22nd at um, 518 Hood Road South in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. A woman by the name of Bethany will be pregnant to and will be giving birth to a child whose name will be John. And in roughly 19 months, John will be weaned. Therefore, violence will be over. Right? That's, what we, that's the specificity that we want, right? But instead, God speaks to us in these shadowed ways. These confusing ways in which we walk away from our experience with God, like ironically having both more faith and trust and more questions and doubt. And that's okay. That's what this message in the scriptures about Ahaz teaches us. That's what Christmas teaches us. I mean, do you honestly think that the shepherds who saw angels appear in the sky were like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. No, faith is messy and it's confusing and it requires exactly that faith and faithfulness and trust and a willingness 
to not have all the answers and a willingness to let go of our desire to have everything wrapped up in a nice, pretty package so that we can feel more secure and safe. Life is inherently insecure. But in the midst of whatever life will bring, the message about the Hebrew Scriptures and the proclamation of Emmanuel being born in the 10th century BCE in the southern kingdom of Judah. In the message of the New Testament in which Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is born in Bethlehem. The message of both is despite the inherent insecurity, despite the contingency of our lives, despite the fact that we are not in control and we will never be in control, the message is God is with us. Let's pray. So Lord, in this time of silence and in this place, come and be with us. Amen. Would you stand and join in singing our second hymn, Infant Holy Infant?